Hi, good afternoon everyone and welcome to Untamed Beyond Boundaries. My name is Shah, the Chef Tikkerer from the Tinkering Studio Science Center Singapore and I will be your host for today. So what is Untamed, you may ask? Untamed was born out of Science Center's ambition to redefine guest experiences and meet the pandemic, leveraging a multi-dimensional approach to spark curiosity and self-learning both on ground and online. This podcast is part of the Untamed Conversations where we will be conversing with some very special guests about wild and wacky topics around science, technology, engineering, and math. And also, to celebrate that it's all untamed, we will be giving out attractive prizes worth up to $80 throughout the event. All you need to do is to share your untamed challenges, experiences, and hashtag UntamedSG on your social media pages to stand a chance to win these prizes. So for today, we are happy to have DJ Tan from Subject Culture. DJ Tan is Singapore's prince of fermentation. He found his passion for food and cooking while studying in the UK during his undergraduate days. Having returned to Singapore, he started work in research at ASTAR and soon found an opportunity to apply his expertise in organic chemistry to food flavors and fermentation. So two years ago, he took up a master's in food science and also founded Subtle Culture to conduct fermentation workshops, to brew and experiment with fermented food products such as to deepen with local culture and culinary identity. So without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, this is what we'll be waiting for. Let's invite the prince of fermentation in the scene, DJ Tan. Hey, Sha, how are you doing? How's everyone? Hey, I'm good down here. You're looking great. And Nice setup over there. Where are you? Yeah, thank you so much. So I'm at my friend's restaurant, the One Nine Two Five Brewing Co. Juchet. Uh, so they are a restaurant focusing on modern Teochew cuisine, and they happen to have a very sleek, very professional setup that they use for their live streamings. Uh, I asked them, and they were very gracious uh, to to you know let, let me board the setup. And and yeah, so therefore we we, we look pretty, pretty fancy today. Uh, and, so, and I think it's perfect because you know I have a kitchen on my right. I have a, a Pub here counter on my left, and it's a very energetic uh, environment. We're talking about food and fermentation today. Oh, yeah, I love food. I think a lot of us here love food. And today, uh, you're going to cover on the topic of uh, food culture, fermentation chemistry, and food microbiology, right? Yes, that's so, right. So, yeah, so we'll be looking in, into these three uh, ideas. And I think, you know, if you ask me, they are very broad, they are very abstract ideas. Uh, and what we want to do today is really to, to look at these three uh, concepts in science and, and look at it through the lens of kimchi. So really a, a dish, a recipe that we you know that most of us are, are familiar with and let's understand the history, uh, the art and a bit of the science behind uh, kimchi and fermentation as well. All right, take it over then. Today we're gonna make, gonna make kimchi DJ time. Thank you so much. Hi, good afternoon everyone. Uh, welcome. My, my name is DJ, the founder of Star Culture. Uh, today, we'll be looking at, uh, as Sean mentioned, food culture, fermentation, and food microbiology. And we're looking at that through the lens of kimchi, so to speak. Uh, but before I go into that, uh, let me introduce myself a bit. Uh, my name is TJ. I graduated, graduated with a degree in chemistry uh, from University College London back in 2016. Uh, following that, I returned to Singapore, uh, where I started my, my work in research. Uh, and then I really wanted to, you know, my, my first passion was chemistry. And, then, and my, my first job was in an organic chemistry laboratory. Uh, so there, what we did was to make you know, complex uh, chemicals from smaller chemicals. So if you imagine uh, your, your toy building blocks, really you're making larger, more complex uh, structures from simpler, easier uh, blocks to handle. Uh, and it was really fun. So I, I felt like, you know, that, that new kid in a, in a toy store, uh, with all the instruments, all, all the tools to play with, uh, and, and that was all enjoyable. Uh, but after a while, I, I got to thinking, and, and I really wanted to find something that I could apply my, my passion in. And I recall, you know, my, my days in, in London where I had to, you know, cook for myself. I had to learn how to you know, operate my kitchen and learn how to use the, the oven, the, the stove hops. Uh, and what I, what I recalled was that, you know, cooking is, is very much a form of kitchen chemistry, right? Uh, and that was how I was really, uh, I saw within myself to, to look at uh, a biosynthesis uh, skin next 
So biosynthesis or the biosynthesis research we are working uh, really means you know we are looking, we are creating complex uh, chemicals, but instead of relying on smaller chemicals, smaller building blocks, we are relying on the machinery, the enzyme within microorganisms like bacteria, like yeast, like fungi, uh, to create all these complex uh, chemicals for us. Uh, and these are uh, ingredients that uh, we see in uh, you know, food, we see in nutrition, we see in skincare, consumer care uh, products. Uh, and, and that was a very interesting, a very eye-opening uh, experience for me. So you know, what, I what I took away was that we can actually apply what we learn uh, in school, in the laboratory, or in the kitchen when we look at you know, fermentation. And it's a very same, um, really, it's the same idea. Uh, and along the way, I, I thought that I wanted to, you know, I would really wanted to study this uh, topic a bit more. And I took up a master's in food science at NUS. Uh, and along, you know, as I started talking to FMB professionals, I realized that there was this uh, gap, this chasm in, in knowledge, this vacuum, uh, where people uh, were very interested to learn about fermentation. They were very interested to look at. Uh, Food biotechnology, industry biotechnology, but you know they are not they aren't always equipped with uh, the know-how, or they don't always have access to, to knowledge or information or, or scientific journals that that we do have in research and, and academia. Uh, and so I founded Salad Culture uh, with you know the express aim of really sharing uh, this platform of fermentation and biotechnology, and to see what you know what are the boundaries that we can push uh, along the way. And yeah, so Star Culture is a is I think first and foremost a food biotechnology company. Uh, we are looking at all things fermented, and we want to look when you use fermentation as a platform you know, to create novel food products. And we see that in our line of uh, kombucha in, in kefir, uh, and with fermentation, I think it's interesting because it allows us to uh, diversify our current sources of protein and nutrition, and I think through that helps us to enhance our food security. Right, so we look at uh, ways we can manufacture or, or create uh, you know, uh, food, food ingredients, normal food ingredients that, that are healthy and nutritious uh, and, and through that, you know, find ways to, to make it sustainable as well. So, on the topic at hand, right, so what is fermentation? To me, fermentation is a biological process, right? So if you look at the kitchen, if you look at, you know, like you're steaming, you're frying something, you're applying heat, you're applying hot water vapor, to transform you know, your raw meat into cooked meat by transforming um, raw carrots into cooked carrots. Fermentation is largely similar uh, with one very big exception. We don't use heat. So we are really relying on microbes, again, the enzymes within the microbes uh, to, to do some of this heavy lifting for us. So instead of using heat, we use microbes to transform. Uh, in this case, for kimchi, we're transforming raw cabbage into cabbage that we can quite readily consume. And this process of fermentation is so unique with that because it also creates very novel uh, flavors or aromas that we don't typically see it in raw cabbage. Uh, and it's just quite so significant that we humans find uh, some of these fermented ingredients, fermented aromas to be so palatable and so enticing. Uh, we may already be familiar with some examples of fermentation. Uh, so these include, uh, for example, like beer. So if you know beer is uh, malted barley that's uh, fermented by yeast. Uh, soy sauce that we see in our kitchens is soybeans fermented by a mold. Uh, in, our, in, our in our local cuisine, uh, tempeh, uh, something that we, that we see quite a lot, uh, tempeh is, is fermented, is soybeans fermented by a mold. Uh, and also you know, we look at yogurt, which is milk fermented by a bacteria. So really fermentation is uh, ubiquitous, it's, it's everywhere around us. Uh, and so it, it uh, I, I think it's uh, quite valuable for us to, to uh, start to learn how the science works. Uh, so for kimchi specifically, we'll, you know, we'll look at the microbiology of it. Uh, what, you know, what's involved in kimchi? Kimchi uses uh, bacteria, right? So uh, we're looking at a particular you know, uh, family or, or class of bacteria. Call them lactic acid bacteria. So they're simply named because they produce lactic acid by consuming sugars. And it's interesting because this lactic acid inhibits the growth of other microbes, uh, which inherently makes kimchi yogurts uh, self-preserving. Uh, examples that we covered earlier include uh, yogurt. Yogurt typically uses uh, lactobacillus, uh, converts lactose into lactic acid. Uh, cheese, lactococcus, uh, is, is used to create 
uh, to acidify the, 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 the milk and to create curds, uh, which is the, the solid block that we see in cheese. And of course, for kimchi, we also want like the acid bacteria, so this consumes the sugars that are present and produces a lightly tangy uh, food product. Other examples of microbes include uh, yeast. So we may, be, we may already be familiar with Saccharomyces cerevisiae that's present in bread making, that's present in beer. So the yeast converts the sugars present uh, in the dough, in the wort, into carbon dioxide, alcohol, uh, which helps to leaven and helps to froth our beer. Uh, as we covered earlier, tempeh uses microbes or the gospels, uh, which creates that, uh, that dense kick that we see uh, in tempeh. All right, so what is kimchi? You may really be familiar that kimchi is an example of lacto fermentation, right? Or lactic acid fermentation. Simply, it's fermentation that produces lactic acid. Uh, and it's interesting because this fermentation is performed by what we call wow lactic acid factor. It's wow because we're not, you know, we're not teaching, we're not adding any uh, strains or cultures into the into the kimchi proper. Uh, we're, we're letting the bacteria naturally present on the, on the surface of the vegetables, on the surface of the leaves, uh, to do you know, the work for us. Kimchi is also fermented anaerobically. What this means is that we'll be fermenting, in a, fermenting it in a sealed jar without oxygen. Uh, this allows us to you know, inhibit some yeast, inhibit some molds, uh, and allow the bacteria to have a bit of a, a head start. And we're using a bit of salt, uh, and this salt helps to preserve the vegetables a bit. Uh, we also go through uh, some of the science uh, later on. Uh, so again, it's, this is a lightly sour uh, fruit product. We know that kimchi produces uh, lactic acid and this helps to preserve, not, not only to preserve the vegetables, but also helps to flavor uh, the dish. Uh, we see kimchi everywhere in, in Korean cuisine. Uh, and uh, and, that, and that's, I think that's how most of us are actually acquainted with the dish. Uh, and if you know, if, if, if you know, uh, about Korean cuisine, you will know that there are as many kimchi recipes as there are households. Uh, every household has their own uh, style of, of, of kimchi, their own recipe. Uh, and so I think that this is a, a, a lovely recipe that you, that you can use because you, you can vary it uh, depending on the ingredients you have on hand, on the, on the style that you like, on the, on the flavors you like, uh, and really on, on your mood. All right, so let's look at the ingredients that we have today. So we have uh, cabbage. So we are, look, we are using Chinese cabbage. Uh, realistically, uh, any cabbage would work as well. Uh, I think the, 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 the fun part about cooking is that you, know, you really can cook with, with however you like. Uh, and what we, and if you're feeling adventurous along the way, you, you are free, you're free to use uh, different vegetables as well. Some people use carrots, radish, uh, garlic chives, cucumbers, and, and, and whatnot as well. So the all important ingredient we have is salt. Uh, so salt helps to inhibit cellulase. Cellulase is an enzyme that breaks down uh, plant fibers. So with salt, uh, we get better texture in our, in our vegetables. Salt also helps to inhibit other microbes. Uh, and this lets uh, our bacteria have a head start in, in, in its fermentation. We're also looking at gochu garu, uh, Korean chili, chili flakes. Uh, realistically, any style of chili flakes would work as well. If you're feeling adventurous, you are free to use uh, cayenne, or you, you can use uh, smoked uh, paprika. Uh, all these will add a specific style of flavor to your kimchi, uh, but really it's uh, a spice meant, meant, meant to accent the, the, the dish. We're also using garlic. Garlic is interesting because you know, it contains a lot of uh, sulfurous compounds, uh, which when fermented, which when broken down, produces a lot of uh, umami, uh, and other volatile aromas. Uh, so this is uh, really, again, something that we use to, to flavor our, our kimchi. Uh, also, we, yes. Can I ask something? Like, yes. um, if you like to, I mean, I love garlic. If I put a lot of garlic, will it affect any of the taste? Yeah, so garlic, uh, I, I think, uh, I'm a firm believer that a, a little bit of garlic goes a long way. Uh, because you can always, you know, add more garlic along the way uh, to your kimchi if, if uh, you feel that it needs more, but it's harder to take out garlic once it's in, in there. Uh, garlic is also quite pungent, uh, and so, you know, I would go light on it first, and then, you know, as you get uh, more familiar with the recipe, you, you get more comfortable with your own 
uh, taste buds in your palate, uh, feel free to go crazy. Okay, thank you. All right. Okay. Yeah, so uh, we also need a bit of uh, sh sugar and, and glutinous sliced flour. So this is uh, a blend. Uh, so this helps, uh, this creates a slurry, which helps to kickstart uh, the fermentation and uh, we use as uh, food for the bacteria, essentially. We'll also be using some sliced ginger. Again, this uh, like very much like garlic, uh, helps to put a bit of uh, pungency, a bit of uh, spice, and a bit of flavor uh, to our kimchi recipe. Um. Any kind of ginger, old ginger, young ginger, blue ginger? Uh, I think, you know, anything uh, young ginger or old ginger would work uh, if, you, if you really like some heat, some warmth in, 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 your, in your recipes. Feel free to go with old ginger. Um, okay. Realistically, uh, yeah, any, any style of ginger would work. Uh, if you, you know, want a, a, a no fruit recipe, you really only need salt and cabbage. So that is as really as, as simple as, as uh, the recipe can get. All right. Thank you. So what right. about that black bottle that you have by the side? What's that? Oh yeah. Thank you for noticing. So we also be using uh, a bit of fish sauce. So fish sauce helps to uh, texture, helps to add some grininess and has to increase the umami or the savoriness of kimchi. Uh, you can use any style of fish sauce, uh, any East Asian uh, style fish sauce will work. Uh, in a pinch, you, you are free to use Nam plus, Thai style fish sauce, or uh, you can use uh, Vietnamese style fish sauce as well. Uh, this bottle that we have on hand today is uh, something that I did uh, as, a, as a hobby, as a, as a small like as a small project. Uh, so this is uh, anchovies fermented in koji that's been fermenting for about I think it's about two years old now. Uh, this wow, two years old. Yeah, so this is going to be a fun way to, to use up some uh, some old uh, projects and uh, laments. Okay, thank you. Carry on. All right, let's go. How you do it. Yeah, so the first step that we want is to chop. So really, we have our uh, cabbage that we have already uh, you know quartered and broken bro bro down into into tips. Uh, so we want to do a very simple, a, a very coarse, very rough chop. So we want to preserve um, some texture, so we don't want to cut our cabbage uh, too finely. Uh, but you definitely want to break it down, and and, then, and this will help with uh, the, the sorting and, and, and the packing later on. So yeah, so we just want you know rough squares, uh, and you can imagine how you like your kimchi to be. If you want something that's closer to you know German style sauerkraut, feel free to go with a fine chop. Uh, if you want to preserve the, the, the texture of whole leaves, you can even leave your, the leaf intact uh, and, and just remove the, the root, the base of the cabbage. So after we chop, we want to uh, prepare uh, our, you know, our garlic, our, our ginger. We just want to prepare a very simple slurry. So here I have some uh, filtered water. So we're, we're going to simply add... So filtered uh, water, you cannot use tap water? Oh, tap, tap water works. Tap water works. Uh, I just happen to have filter water on hand. Uh, so you know, not, nothing fancy, just uh, regular water, uh, regular drinking water is fine. So this is our sugar and, and glutinous rice flour mix. So we're, we're going to stir it to create a, a bit of a slurry. Uh, and just uh, set, set it aside for, for later on. All right, so after we chop, we want to sort our vegetables. So what we want to do is to get a, uh, a mixing bowl. We add our cabbage to it. All right, uh, and we want to add 3% uh, by weight of salt. So what this means is that, you know, you want to take, uh, you want to measure, the, you want to weigh the amount of cabbage, the, the, the weight of cabbage that you're that you using. Uh, you know, calculate three percent of it, uh, and then figure figure out how much salt you need. Right. So if you're using uh, a, a kilo of, of cabbage, that could come up to you know, thirty grams of salt. So what you want to do is to add, you know, uh, scatter the salt across the cabbage. Right. You want to mix it in. So what this does is. You, you really want to get the salt into the leaves, into the, the crevices of, of the cabbage. 
uh, and, and that helps, uh, that, that allows the salt to pull out moisture from the, from the cabbage, so you don't want too much uh, of water content coming from the leaves. So this process is uh, a bit mundane, it, it takes anywhere from you know, two to three hours to six to eight hours uh, for, the, for the salt to do its thing. Uh, so if you want to you know, salt it early, uh, let, it, let, let it stand, uh, you know, come to it every half hour or so just to flip it, make sure that everything is, uh, you know, coated in salt, uh, give it a light squeeze to remove any excess moisture. Uh, and then, you know, come back to it a uh, few hours later. So this can be done, you know, in the morning, uh, in the afternoon, and you can come back uh, later in the day when, when you are, uh, when you are some free time. Yeah. Okay. So the salt actually is not only for flavoring, but to remove the water content. Yeah, so the salt helps, you know, the salt work basically, you know, does really two things at least, right? So one, it, it flavors the kimchi. Uh, so a bit of salt helps to bring out uh, some umami flavors, helps to bring out uh, the, the spiciness and, and the aromas uh, of fermentation. And of course, the salt also helps to initiate uh, this uh, breakdown of the cabbage. So as, as the moisture is removed, uh, it, it allows the, 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 the cabbage to be, be easier fermented and easier broken down. Uh, in the later steps. So today we have a bit of cooking show magic. So while we have just sorted uh, the cabbage now, I have some pre-sorted cabbage that we made earlier. So you can see that some of the, some water is coming out. Is there some water yeah, coming out uh, from the cabbage? Uh, so this is really the, the action of salt. Uh, and you want anyone to do it, you know, early on, uh, and just squeeze out some moisture, right? And that's good to go. Right, so uh, for the next step, I like to add a bit of, I, used to use, I like to use a pair of gloves just because it helps with the mixing. Uh, we also going to add a bit of, uh, you know, garlic, chili flakes. Uh, so it's, it may not be very helpful to, uh, to, to use your, your, your bare hands like that. All right. So you, so we have, uh, yeah. yep, so we remove any excess moisture. You can see that our cabbage looks definitely looks a bit more limp, a little limp, uh, looks a bit more wilted, and, and so that, that's kind of uh, texture that we're going for, right? We add a bit of garlic, DJ. There's a question from the floor. Yes. Uh, they were asking, like, uh, if they don't eat vegetables, have you tried substitute with fruits instead, like uh, green apples or guava or young papaya? Yeah, yeah you, you, you're, you're free to use. I think uh, green apple would be very interesting. Uh, substitute uh, guava would work as well. Um, I think they will give a very lovely texture and they will make for a very interesting uh, white, white cabbage substitute. Yeah. All right, thank you. Yeah. So you can use, I think, yeah, young papaya will be very, very interesting. Oh yeah, lovely. And if you if you are into, you know, uh, Thai style uh, pickles and ferments, you're you're free to use, you know, green mango, uh, a bit of a bit of uh, pineapple as well. Uh, Interestingly, yeah. uh, you know, if you look at you know our Indian Singaporean acha, uh, yes. you, you can also make a, a fermented acha. So I, I see acha almost like a Korean, uh, almost like a. A, a local kimchi, kimchi as a you know, Korean acha, uh, and you're free to use you know a uh, bit of peanut, peanuts, pineapple, uh, cucumbers, uh, in, in your in your ferment, right? So you know at home, uh, in your kitchen, you are you are the boss, <laughs> you can you can do whatever, whatever you like. All right. Okay. So yeah. we have our garlic. We're gonna add a bit of uh, well, ginger. And we're gonna add some. Uh, chili fig as well. So really uh, with the chili, with the garlic, the ginger, you want to you know, season to taste, right? So you want to add as much as, as you like. If you want it to be spicy, you're free to add uh, you know, more ginger, more chili. If you are not a fan of spice, you want to go with fruits, you want to make a white kimchi, feel free to omit the, the chili fig altogether or, or just uh, go easy on it, right? So we have uh, our you know, so this is our pre pre kimchi, and this might be a fun salad to eat on its own, right? Uh, there's not, not, nothing wrong with that. Uh, but today we're going to ferment it. Yeah, 
did a fish sauce when you really a bit most of that way again. Alright, so that's done. So that's our premix. Right, the next step is to pack. So what you want, you want to have a, a jar with a, you know, an airtight lid. A glass jar. Um, you know, I, I happen to have a glass jar with me, uh, but you're free to use any uh, food safe jar if you want to go, you know, super traditional. Some people like to use an earthenware pot because they feel that uh, they find that, you know, it, it really has that traditional feel, that vibe to it. All right. Uh, you know, glass jar works if you have a food safe plastic. So Plastic uh, containers. Uh, oh, yeah. okay. So after mixing the spices and the, and, and the fish sauce with, with the salted vegetables, uh, you want to uh, mix it thoroughly. And what we want to do is we want to slowly add our kimchi to the jar. So of course the jar has been pre-washed, uh, has been sterilized, clean and sanitized, right? And just make sure that everything everything you're using is, is clean and you, and you don't want to, you know, uh, so right now when right now when you're putting uh all of the uh, vegetables inside the mixture do you want you don't want the water that's left over yeah so bowl? uh you, you don't you don't really need that water so uh that comes from a bit of that fish sauce uh but realistically all you need to uh is, is the vegetables All right, so this is uh, what we have. Uh, ideally, you want to use a, a smaller uh, smaller jar, uh, a jar that really fits the volume of, of uh, the fermentation that you have, right? So once we have that jar, you want to add uh, your slurry. So this is, again, this is the sugar, uh, which is my flour slurry. And this will help to keep the vegetables submerged. Yeah, so there's just sugar and water. Yep, sugar, water, a bit of rice flour. You can see that it's uh, submerged like this. And that is done. So this is uh, very little, this is obviously very little kimchi. Uh, and this is almost, you know, one person serving. Uh, you can make as many, as many uh, jars as you want with many different flavors and, and recipes. Uh, but this is really as, as simple as it gets. Uh, and of course, the last step in, in kimchi fermentation is the waiting game, right? So you need to yeah. uh, let really it sit, and you, want, and you want to let it sit, uh, you know, somewhere. I, I recommend room temperature, uh, and really uh, where, where the temperature that, that, that sits in uh, affects how long it takes. So if you remember, you know, uh, science, you remember biology and physics, when something is cooler, it takes uh, longer for the reaction to occur. So yeah. if it's at room temperature, it may take, you know, uh, seven days, ten days. You put it in the fridge. It could take uh, fourteen days, twenty days. Uh, so that's something that you just want to keep in mind. So again, you cover the airtight lid. This, this is an anaerobic ferment. You don't want you don't want oxygen to go in. Uh, you don't want to let too much air in uh, because air can can uh, introduce uh, contaminants. Can also allow uh, yeast and mold to, to start growing. Uh, store it store it somewhere you know comfortable, somewhere uh, cool, N not too warm, not, not not perhaps not not too near your the stove top. Um, but generally away from, from direct sunlight, right? You know that sunlight uh, can uh, kill certain microbes, sunlight can also uh, change uh, or create off flavors uh, in your ferments. Okay. At any point of time, uh, will how how do you know if your kimchi has failed? Uh, how it has failed? So you, you will know, uh, so you know, when you look at kimchi, it, you typically don't see uh, anything uh, growing, right? So you see something that's uh, uh, moldy or, or, or yeasty or something something strange doing a kimchi, you know that's, that's something to be wrong there. Uh, so good kimchi should look uh, like this, as is, entirely. Uh, you may see some bubbling so that you know that the lactic acid bacteria is, is working, it producing, it's consuming the sugars to produce carbon dioxide. Uh, and, and, and that's how you tell. Uh, along the way, you may want to open the lid ever so slightly. Will that, will that be an outer smile? Yeah, so you, you let you, you open a little bit uh, and, and that allows you know some excess okay. pressure built in to escape. And you can you can also from that just smell the kimchi a bit. Uh, you should really get you know a very light uh 
like a very kimchi esque aroma. So it's, it's quite hard to describe it because it's uh, very savory, it's, it's quite complex. But it should smell like kimchi and it should smell increasingly sour as it goes on. Uh, so really you want to use use your senses, right? So you, you, you use your eyes, you, you can visually uh, assess the kimchi, that, that make sure it's okay. Uh, you can smell. And of course, uh, as it goes on, if it smells, if it looks right, if it smells right, uh, you are free to taste it as well. Uh, and of course, here we have some uh, tips and tricks. So always you want to make sure that you observe proper uh, food safety and, and, and hygiene. Wash your hands, uh, use a glove uh, as, as I did earlier. Uh, you want to make sure that your equipment is clean. Uh, if you need a stronger detergent, uh, feel free to go for it. Uh, but in general, I find uh, if you're making food at home, uh, it is not always required. Right? You also want to avoid cross contamination. So if you are you know, handling meat before and you're going to use the same uh, you know, chopping board, knife, handle, uh, kimchi, make sure that you clean everything. You don't want to you know, accidentally introduce, introduce uh, pathogens uh, from spoiled food to your kimchi. You want to use your sensors, use your eyes, your nose, uh, your, your taste buds. Uh, and since we are, you know, we are doing this for, uh, for uh, a science show for STEM festival, I encourage you to keep a logbook. So what I like to do is to write down uh, my recipes that, that, that I'm using, uh, and that helps, helps me keep track of you know, what I'm doing right or what I'm doing wrong. And so if I, if I want to troubleshoot, if I want to go back to it, uh, there's always uh, that to look for. Uh, and finally, of course, uh, feel, free, feel free to experiment and have fun. Uh, really, this is uh, your kitchen, this is your ferment. So uh, the, I think I think it's, it's more it's more interesting if, if you are uh, enjoying uh, what you're doing. You're doing, yeah, that's right. So like what you just shared, ladies and gentlemen, you can always if you don't eat vegetables, you can always substitute with fruits. Right, you were suggesting like uh, young mangoes, uh, young papaya, guava, or green apples. This will work too. Uh, yeah, there's a question on the floor. One more about uh, the type of salt. Can they use a table salt or they have to use like what you, the salt that you've been using? Uh, so I think I, I'm, I'm using sea salt because that's what I happen to have on hand. But you're free to use uh, table salt. Um, some people recommend non iodized salt if you have that, sure. Uh, but I, in my experience, I, I, I don't find that to be absolutely necessary. Uh, so, you know, really, I think the, the whole fun part of the nation is that you are able to use ingredients that you have on hand, that you have uh, readily at home. Uh, so, yeah, uh, I would say go with that first. The salt table. So, is the same, still 3% of your... Yeah, so I'll, I'll go with 3% uh, by weight. So, uh, typically, salt measurements change uh, depending on the, the size of the crystals. If you're using, you know, diamond crystal, uh, kosher salt, uh, the volume is, is a bit different. One, one tablespoon of table salt is not the same as one tablespoon of you know, diamond crystal kosher. But if you're using by weight, uh, you know, that helps present like everything. So you know, you, if you have a kitchen scale, that's great. It help. It really helps a lot. Uh, you can re remove a lot of the estimation and, and, and aggravation out of the picture. Uh, for here in the kitchen, I have everything uh, pre-weighed, uh, just to make it uh, convenient. Okay. Uh, another question from the floor. Um, talking about like currently the temperature right now, like you say room temperature, right? Put it out in room temperature, and currently we are experiencing the temperature is quite low right now. So, will that be uh, any difference? Or can you just yeah. store it in the fridge? So, I think the, the, the interesting thing that, you know, if you're doing it at home, it's almost a very artisanal project, right? Uh, and it's, as, 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 a, as a very living, as a, bi as a biological process, it adapts, it sort of changes with the, with the environment. Uh, so, what you want to do is just to keep an eye on it. Uh, there is no, uh, you know, there's no hard number to it, right? So, some, for people who like to keep it to be more sour, like the cabbage, the, like the, the cabbage to be you know, more wilted, they may, they may leave it on for you know, 14, 20 days, 28 days even. Or some people who like you know, slightly sour, uh, you know, sauerkraut or like slightly sour pickles, they may want to eat their kimchi uh, earlier. They want, to, they want to preserve it earlier. Uh, and if you want to preserve it, you know, you can always move it from the room temperature, move it to the fridge, and, and that helps to slow it down uh, quite a bit. Yeah, uh, there's a question from Mr. Saad down here. He's asking, what's the difference between kimchi and sauerkraut? Is there any difference in the fermentation process? So if, if you ask me, they are essentially the same, right? So they are, and I, and I say that at the risk of offending some Koreans and Germans out there, 
Uh, they are the same because they are both styles of fermented cabbage. Um, uh, they, they may use slightly different cabbages, but they are both you know, fermented leafy cabbages. Uh, to me, the main difference lies in, in the, the spices, the, the, the flavorings. Uh, kimchi uses you know, more savory ingredients. We are using garlic, we are using fish sauce, we are using chili flakes, chili powder, sauerkraut, uh, you may be using you know, juniper berries, caraway seeds, uh, but they both require at the, at, the, uh, at the minimal, they both require cabbage, they both require salt. Uh, so that is you know, what they have in common. Uh, so for, for the fermentation process, uh, you know, we, sauerkraut is generally fermented at a slightly warmer temperature. Uh, kimchi generally slightly colder, so sauerkraut is generally done, uh, it's generally completed faster, uh, but essentially that's, uh, that's about it. Yeah. Okay, so for the chili itself, right, you're using chili flakes, the Korean chili flakes. So yeah, yeah. can we use any chili or maybe any chili paste like those, uh, the one with Lachan? Yeah, uh, so if you're using Lachan, then you're also sort of forcing over into slightly more Acha uh, style territories. So that is perfectly fine. And I think, you know, uh, you, I, I, do, I do encourage uh, our, our audience to, to, to be adventurous and to, to try different flavors. Uh, so feel free to go with Lachan. Uh, I you can you can if you don't have you know, chili powder or chili flakes on hand you are feel, you are free to use fresh chilies as well. Uh, those work great. Uh, I, I I will caution because this is uh, ultimately a, a fermented product. Uh, so you want to make sure that the ingredients you're adding are clean. Uh, you know balachan uh, fish sauce because these have been fermented they may carry over certain microbes uh, into the kimchi which you may not want. So I would, you know, as, as you experiment, as you adventure, as you, as you uh, try different things, I would just also be careful uh, and just you know, create a lot more, make sure that you know, you know what you're doing, what you're, what you're adding, uh, and, and I think that helps with the experimentation process. All right. Another question from Linda. She's asking, how did you discover your passion for food and food science? I, you know, I, I, if, I, if, I, if I may borrow some nationalistic uh, sentiment here, I think, you know, it's, it's, as Singaporeans or people who are, who are living in Singapore, we generally consider ourselves to be quite strong foodies, right? Uh, so really it all started when, uh, when I moved to, to the UK and I, and I found that I really had to, to cook for myself. I really had to uh, go grocery shopping for myself uh, just in order to eat, to survive. Uh, food their takeaways were simply uh, out of my student budget. So as I was cooking, uh, I, I found that I realized I could actually apply my, my chemistry knowledge and, and, and know-how, uh, you know, the, the lessons I learned from, from laboratory, from tutorials, from lectures, uh, into the communication and, and, and use that to help uh, help me improve my cooking. So if you look at uh, what we call uh, the, the Maillard reaction, right? So that's when you, you ground uh, meats, you browns the vegetables, and it gets it gets a caramel color. It gets a, what we call a deepening of flavor. So all that is really chemistry, right? So in, in the Maya reaction, we're looking at how sugars get with amino acids to create again uh, novel, complex uh, flavor flavor and aroma molecules. So all that all that is uh, chemistry, and I think crucially, all that is kitchen chemistry. So it's been it's been quite a fun process just to see. The how we can actually run our, run our own chemistry experiments uh, at home in our kitchen, and it all started from there. And, and you know, as I as I was you know reading up more, and I started looking at uh, coffee. Uh, I started taking out courses in, in as, as a barista to, to make make coffee to, to brew coffee. I started talking to F and B professions, professionals, sorry, uh, uh, chefs, bartenders, baristas, and it, it, it was all a, a very interesting feel. And I think it helps that. Uh, Singapore, as, as we are today, we are, we are looking to position ourselves as this uh, uh, hub of, of, of for food science, for the FMB industry, uh, for the food, nutrition, consumer care industry. Uh, so, I think, so I think that has helped to, to give some uh, credibility to, to the field and, and to the industry. Um, yeah, there's a question uh, with regards to kimchi itself. Uh, name the bacteria that's in kimchi. And what are the health benefits of eating kimchi? So uh, this is a very interesting question, and I think I've uh, deliberately sidestepped uh, that crucial bit of information earlier on. Uh, the, the reality is that 
everyone's kimchi can be a bit different. Right, the, the, the kimchi that I make today because of the cabbage I'm using, because of the equipment I'm using, uh, will carry certain bacteria. The kimchi that you make at home, because of the cabbage that you're using, because of the equipment that you're using, may have a slightly different you know, bacterial population. So, uh, there is no one right answer to the bacteria in your kimchi. Uh, what we do know is that kimchi contains, uh, can contain uh, like acid bacteria, typically of the uh, kernel stock or the pediococcus uh, genre, uh, genus, and, and, uh, and yeah, and that, and that's that. Uh, for the health benefits of kimchi, some of them are still uh, unproven, so I would, I would, I would hesitate, I would, I would be a bit more cautious to, to advocate for them uh, here. Uh, but in general, we do see a, a, correl a correlation between good gut health and, you know, uh, good overall uh, well-being. Uh, so that that's about all I can say about health benefits of, of kimchi. All right. So how long can we keep the kimchi outside? You know, like after you make and then um, you start to consume it, right? Yeah. And then you put it outside. How long will it take? Yeah. So, you know, I would leave it out for about a week, uh, 10 days sometimes, if I forget to check on it. Uh, and I'll, 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 I'll just keep checking it. Uh, after that, uh, I, I would caution against opening it too, too, too often, too much, because that allows air to go in, and uh, again, that, that can allow uh, contaminants to, to enter. So I'll, I'll check on it, and then uh, when it's ready, uh, I'll you know, put it in the fridge, put it uh, in the chiller, and just allow it to, to preserve its, its current state. Uh, so if done well, kimchi is inherently self-preserving. So um, again, the, the lactic acid bacteria prevents other microbes from uh, getting a photo. So if, if you do it well, you know, your kimchi should last you indefinitely, at least until you finish it, right? Uh, so make sure that you are using clean utensils whenever you're, you're handling it. You don't want to uh, eat, uh, you know, lick, lick a spoon and, and, put, and throw it back into the jar. So uh, for you, with Sutter Culture, besides um, doing kimchi for fermentation, what are other products that You've been doing. Uh, so we are really looking to look. Uh, we are really looking at at uh, culture and not just you know uh, the social culture, but also the science, microbial culture. We are looking at uh, you know, uh, finding our own bacteria, our own yeast, our own mold. And along the way, we are also we are looking at uh, products, fermented products like kombucha, which is a fermented tea beverage. We are looking at kefir, which is again another fermented beverage. And we're also talking to uh, partners, uh, collaborators to look at novel food uh, ingredients uh, and to find ways to, to enhance our, uh, our food sustainability here in Singapore. Uh, and of course, if you check out our uh, Facebook group, so we also have a page uh, called the Singapore Fermentation Exchange. Uh, this is our free online forum for people to experiment, to learn and, and to network with other uh, home fermenters, home brewers. Uh, so what we encourage and what, what, what we try to do is to, is to build this, this library of, of, of home fermenters, this library of, of home cultures. Uh, and we want to encourage people to you know, share the stories, share the experiments, share the recipes. Uh, and because of that, we want to provide uh, access to our uh, workshop content and all for free uh, on, on Facebook. Uh, I also have people who you know are going online to, to ask for kombucha cultures, kefir cultures, kimchi cultures even, uh, and, and and really to really share culture from a, from a social point of view as well as from a, a microbiological point of view. Oh, thank you, DJ, for sharing. Um, and with that, thank you. And remember, when it comes to STEM, nothing is beyond boundaries. So say hi, bye, everyone. <laughs>